Well, hello and welcome to this free webinar sponsored by Ministry Pacific on church budgeting. We are delighted to have with us uh, Max Herr, president of Church and Ministry Compliance Consulting, and someone who is passionate about budgeting and has a lot of experience with church budgeting. He has been a compliance specialist for the Southern Baptist Convention and has vast experience in uh, church and nonprofit regulatory matters and operations. So this topic of budgeting is uh, uh, something that he's both passionate about and uh, has expertise in. So I am going to let Max uh, jump in and begin his presentation. I'm going to step back and just listen like everybody else. So welcome, everyone. Uh, the Budgeting Your Church for 2024 presentation that you're about to see includes a lot of basic information about budgeting and budgeting concepts. And we're going to take a brief look at three specific but different approaches to constructing a budget midway through the presentation. So when I, when I do a, a presentation on bylaws or work with a church on bylaws, I talk about the bylaws as being the, the skeleton of the church uh, and its governance. And if that's true, budgeting is the backbone of the church. It's the function of the budget to hold up the church and allow it to go where it wants to go. But you need to treat your budget as a roadmap, not as the Ten Commandments carved in stone. Your budget needs to be bold and imaginative, but it also needs to be reasonable and realistic. And more than anything else, you need to understand that where you intend to go is uh, probably going to encounter some detours over the course of the year. And sometimes you can plan for those if you know, um, for example, that um, you might be adding a staff person in the middle of the year. Uh, you budget an annual salary for that person, but you're only going to expend half of it along the way. Um, and then the, the COVID chaos of 2020 threw a big detour into the path of almost all churches across the country. Um, it's very important, I think, at least in my experience, that you don't tinker with your budget once you've adopted it. If you need to overspend, you overspend. Uh, when you overspend on a line item in the budget, it usually means that it wasn't adequately budgeted. You didn't forecast the need properly, or it means that, let's say it's the children's ministry budget. Uh, you were serving 20 kids. And now all of a sudden you're serving a hundred. That's certainly going to expand more resources of the church along the way. So don't be concerned about overspending. Um, a lot of overspending happens because of deferred maintenance because it's not built into the budget. The starting point for any budgeting or accounting system is what's called a chart of accounts. It's the only way that you can logically keep track of the revenue and expenses and the assets and liabilities of the church corporation. Um, the chart of accounts should be deep enough to accurately reflect the most important de details, but it doesn't have to be cumbersome. Um, late in the presentation, near the end, you'll see uh, the way that I would present the budget to the church, and you'll see that main line items had the overall budget, but beneath those main line items was a short list of things that the church could expect to spend money on, but we didn't keep track of them as individual line items. That's why I talk about being cumbersome. You don't need 500 line items to keep track of everything that the church is spending on. It does require a little more accountability when folks are requesting reimbursements or asking for expenses to be paid. If you don't adequately structure the chart of accounts, it will have a, a series of domino effects. Uh, the chief one among them is that your financial reports will be a mess. They won't uh, be logically structured. They won't be easy to read. People won't understand what they're seeing. They, they can't see the, the detail or they don't understand the information. 
And the worst uh, effect of all of that is that when your reporting is confusing, it doesn't exp- it doesn't instill confidence in your donors. And when your donors are confident that the church is doing the right thing with its money, they give more. That was my experience in 10 years of serving as church treasurer was over the 10 years, even through, and that began in 2008 when we were uh, right on the cusp of all that financial turmoil in the housing market. Um, Our church budget doubled over 10 years. We never ran a a deficit in those 10 years. And um, a lot of it had to do with the fact that I had uh, completely overhauled the structure of the financial reports and people could see exactly how the church was spending its money. In my experience, what I've seen a lot of churches do is they just have a a list of numbers. And um, if they need to add something to the chart of accounts, they just use the next number in order. And it may not be in the proper place within the structure of a chart of accounts. So what I try and show churches and and other nonprofits is that a formal chart of accounts should be structured into at least four, maybe more basic components. You need a set of line items for your cash assets. You need line items for your accounts payable and designated funds. You need a line item for your general fund And if you have any restricted funds, such as a building fund, uh, you need a line item for that. Those first three sets of uh, line items, they make up what's known as your balance sheet or your asset and liability report. But beyond that, you have all of your revenue items and you have your expense items. Revenue will typically be organized into three or more primary categories. You have your regular revenue. Uh, You might refer to it as tithes. You might refer to some of it as anonymous giving. We called it loose plate money. Um, You'll have designated revenue. This is money that folks give specifically to support ministries and activities of the church. Uh, Your men's ministry may be going on a a summer uh, retreat, and you need to collect money for the lodging and food expenses. So you want to hold that money uh, and earmark it specifically for that need. If you have, excuse me, a capital giving campaign underway, you're raising money to buy property or build a new building, um, that's called restricted money. And restricted money uh, has to be kept separate on uh, specifically on paper, but it really needs to be kept separate from all other money of the church, even in a a separate bank account. And then, uh, of course, you have money that comes in and you can't fit it into any of those other categories. And you just need a placeholder for miscellaneous revenue. It could be uh, a refund of Uh, premiums from an insurance company or claims payment, for example, um, or somebody gives money for church flowers and uh, you don't want to just plug it in with the tithe money. You also may have, and many churches do have, non-church revenue. You may be operating a school or a daycare, or you may have a cell phone tower, or more recently churches are being approached uh, by companies that want to put uh, battery storage uh, units on their their vacant land. Um, So that's money that the church would welcome uh, as part of its revenue stream, but it shouldn't be counted in any of those other categories. Also in the basics, your expenses need to be organized into at least six different key categories or or components. The first of these I refer to as kingdom work. Um, And this is the areas of fellowship, ministry, missions, and worship. And uh, last week I was talking with a, a pastor, a good friend of mine, and he said, when you 
do your webinar. He says, you have to focus on this kingdom work stuff. That was the biggest change that we made in our budget structure that you helped us with was showing these expenses so that people can see how we're spending their money for the work that we're trying to do. Because everybody knows that the church has general operating expenses. They know you have office expenses. They know you have personnel expenses. And if you're running a school or a daycare, you have those other non-church expenses that um, should really be self-supporting. They shouldn't be detracting from the church's revenue stream at all. You need to identify all of your reportable items with a fund number. Uh, a better structure divides money and assets into reporting groups. Assets and liabilities are properly identified in those areas and revenue and expenses are clearly separated and organized. The, the most common structure is one that uses a logical numeric sequence. And uh, the one that I was taught many years ago uses 1,000s, uh, like 1,100 would be the church's general fund checking account, 1,102 would be a, a savings account, 1,103 might be the uh, payroll account. Um, those are all of your cash accounts where money is on deposit, the 1,000s. The 2000s are your accounts payable liabilities. Your, uh, if you have payroll and you're withholding income tax money uh, for state or federal contributions, um, you need to mark those as payables until they're actually paid so that you don't spend that money uh, inadvertently. Your designated funds, when people are giving to the children's ministry or the men's ministry or a fellowship activity, that's temporarily restricted money, so it's known as designated funds. Your general fund is a 3,000 account, and any restricted funds like a building, a building fund would be listed in the 3,000s as well. And these are permanently restricted funds. You can't use them for any other purpose other than what the donor has um, identified. The 4,000s are your various revenue items. Your 5,000s are your program and operating expenses. 6,000s are personnel expenses. And if you have some of those other activities, um, the school or a food bank or a daycare, uh, you want to use another set of sequences for those so that your, your chart of accounts is very logical and each of the items are organized into a proper place. Your chart of accounts establishes the, the, the structure for your annual budget and your financial reports should follow the exact same pattern as the budget and, and chart of accounts. So in your chart of accounts, you, you build in placeholders for every type of revenue and designated or restricted fund. It doesn't mean you're going to budget money in each of those areas. Uh, in some years, you may not budget any money in any of those areas um, specifically. The same thing holds true for expense items. You need a placeholder for every line item that you want to track specifically, but you don't need a line item for every expense. In other words, under your office expenses, uh, if you're buying pens and pencils and paper, uh, you just can log all that as a general office expense. You don't need a light item for pens, another light item for pencils, another light item for paper. That's just too detailed um, and it's unnecessary bookkeeping. This is the point in time if, if your church is on a calendar year, fiscal year, we're now six months uh, behind us with this fiscal year. So this is the time, July or August, to begin working on your next year's budget. You wanna be able to complete it by September or October so that if, um, let's say your, your church members need to vote on and approve the budget, 
you have it available to approve by the end of October if for some reason your budget presentation goes south and it doesn't get approved, you still have the months of November and December to uh, restructure the budget and get it passed by the end of the year. But in that preparation process, you really need to know where you stand at mid-year. If your treasurer has not been giving the church monthly or quarterly financial reports, it's going to leave you in a, a precarious position because you're not going to know how much you've spent uh, and where you are at mid-year and how you need to budget based on what you can foresee in the future. Um, your ministry leaders and your, your group leaders and your, your paid staff, they need to know what their focus is for the coming year and what their budget requirements may need to be. But when it comes to programming the expenses, I, I can't emphasize enough that you have to begin with the kingdom work of the church. This is by far the most important aspect of your budget. It's more important than the personnel expense. It's more important than the operating expenses because this is your commitment to having an effective church that reaches the community for Christ. And um, you've got to determine what you're going to spend on your fellowship and outreach activities. Um, you need to know how much you're going to support your various ministries and your mission activities. And um, the worship experience, my goodness, um, you're drawing people to the church on Sunday. Um, to a certain extent, people expect to be entertained at church, and I'm not, I'm not saying that you have to, to be entertaining, but you want that worship experience to be attractive. And when I talk about attractive, I mean the things that draw people in and keep them coming back. Um, the light shows themselves, those aren't necessarily attractive. Uh, and sometimes uh, churches go overboard and, and it actually detracts from the worship experience. But, um, you know, many churches uh, have video projectors and they're not using them effectively to enhance the worship service. Uh, pastors are not figuring out, some of them, how to use PowerPoint to uh, come alongside their, uh, their message on Sunday morning. So you need to work on, on your worship and tech. Once you've got all of your kingdom work uh, allocated, now it's time to add in your operating expenses, your office expenses, and your personal expenses. Now, these expenses are truly the unavoidable elements of your budget. But don't mistake unavoidable as the same as uncontrollable. You absolutely need to be able to control these expenses, um, and you have to monitor them. And that's why having this good structured budget, having sound financial reports, you're getting the reports from your, your treasurer from month to month. Uh, if you're part of the leadership team or you're the pastor or the church administrator, so that you can see what your spend is. Um, frequently, when I ask a church, uh, for a copy of its financial reports. What I get is not a financial report. It looks more like the checkbook register. These were the four weekly deposits, and these are the 15 checks we wrote this month. But it doesn't tell anybody where you are in relation to what you've budgeted for the year. Um, and the church feels good that it still has a positive balance in the checkbook, but that's not financial reporting. Once all the expenses have been determined, now you go to the revenue side. You have to balance the budget. And you balance the budget primarily with your regular revenue. If you know that you have reasonable contributions to your designated and restricted revenue, you can plug those numbers in. But you don't use designated or restricted revenue um, expectations 
you don't use that to balance the budget. You use your regular revenue to balance the budget. And then any miscellaneous revenue that, that you might expect, you want to plug in numbers for that. Now, the three methods of budgeting that we're going to look at, um, they all begin on the expense side. None of them begin with the revenue. Your spending needs to be determined using one of three common budgeting methods. The one that most churches use is um, what I refer to as traditional. Um, some people refer to it as, as incremental. Um, but another legitimate and um, valid method of budgeting is called activities-based. And then the last one that's listed here, zero-based, is complex. And we're going to talk about that. Each of these three methods of budgeting has advantages and disadvantages. And so we're going to look at both of those. In a traditional annual budget, the church simply looks at the current year budget, 2023, and says, well, here we are at mid-year. We're pretty close to being on track. Um, maybe we need to improve the, the budget or increase the budget for next year by uh, 5% or 10%. And so you just apply those percentage increases sometimes across the board. Um, sometimes you look at individual light items and make specific predictions. Um, often the increases are based on inflation. Uh, sometimes new items are added and Sometimes items are deleted. We're no longer doing something. So we can just take that out. But in a traditional budget, structural changes are, are very uncommon. The, the budget seems to be the same year after year after year. You need to expect and factor in expenses, especially for items such as utilities, property tax, insurance premiums, and any debt service that the church has. Um, you also need to budget in any pay and benefit increases for your staff. And if you increase pay, you may have to uh, recalculate what the church has to pay on its own for Social Security and Medicare, the FICA contributions. If you do know that you're adding new ministries or you're expanding existing ministries, you need to budget for those. And then any remaining light items, um, after you factored these, uh, you fund those as needed. The advantage of a traditional budget is that they're simple to establish. They're usually pretty easy to adopt. Few items, if any, are added or deleted from one year to the next. Uh, it generally assures the continuity of existing programs and ministries. Now, that could be good or bad um, because sometimes ministries are stagnant and uh, we just keep funding them anyway, expecting something to change, perhaps. Um, what you don't see in most traditional budgets are large deviations from the current year or prior budgets. Those are just not common changes from one year to the next, unless the church is changing its focus. And this happened in my church uh, back in 2010. Uh, we had a new pastor come in in 2008. He spent 2009 pretty much getting acquainted with the church and the church getting acquainted with him. But in 2009, the new pastor began to focus the church on its mission activities and mission role. And in 2010, we made a commitment to enlarge our mission budget considerably and uh, made a big difference in both our budget and the giving of the church. A disadvantage of traditional budgeting is that if it's the same budget year after year, it's unimaginative. And um, people who might be expecting change don't see it, and they're not inspired. Uh, the most frequent result is the perpetuation of ineffective ministries or programs. 
Um, we've been doing this for years. Um, Sister Smith has been in charge of this for years. And if we cancel it, uh, now what's she going to do? And so we keep something going, um, not necessarily for the best reason. Uh, often this traditional budgeting method doesn't enable the growth of kingdom work or new ministries. It often discourages risk-taking. Um, you know, the, the children's minister comes in and says, I've got these great plans to double the size of the children's ministry. So I need to double my budget at least. And the church leaders don't see it and don't budget it that way. So it stifles the, the growth of that ministry. And worst of all, it just doesn't reflect any need for change. You know, we've been doing the same thing year after year. We're not losing any money. We're not making great leaps in the amount of giving that people are, are contributing. Um, so why, why do anything different? One of the biggest hazards in a traditional budget is we forget to allocate for deferred maintenance. Um, and when you are not deferred, we forget to allocate for current maintenance. And when you don't do that, it becomes deferred maintenance. Um, everybody knows that the air conditioner doesn't work very well during the summer months. But uh, replacing the air conditioner is maybe a $20,000 project. So we'll just keep putting it off until it finally breaks, and then we'll figure out how we're going to get the money. Not a wise thing. Deferred maintenance, um, typically the dollar that you don't spend this year when you eventually need to spend it turns into 3 or $4, and that's just not... Um, that's just not good stewardship of the church's resources. An activity-based budget begins by evaluating and funding all aspects of kingdom work. Once again, you focus on what it is we're going to do to expand the cause of Christ in our community. But an activity-based budget asks different questions. It asks, what's the profitability to the church? How will this impact our community? Will we be able to define and measure the results that we're looking for? And most importantly, will this attract and retain new visitors and, and existing members? Um, now, the word profitability doesn't mean is this raising revenue for the church. The profitability to the church is the impact to the community and the attraction of new visitors and members. Once you have done those, you've asked those questions, now you need to analyze and determine actual ministry needs in relation to objectives. This is a hard part. Uh, you need to consider what the, the operating expenses are for each ministry, the paper, the printing supplies, any promotional expense, consumables, you know, churches that do vacation Bible school know that there's a, a fairly significant capital outlay for a kit and craft resources and things. And hopefully your, your church members are donating a lot of that stuff, but some of it you just have to go out and buy. Uh, so you need to budget for it. If you have expenses of participation, if you're going to be charging admitting admission fees or you're going to be providing meals and snacks or refreshments or you have to rent things or you're going to buy stuff, uh, the swag, stuff we all get, um, bag, gift bags and, and trinkets and things, pens, pencils, uh, coffee cups, um, what are those expenses you have to allocate for that? The final step, just like in the traditional budget, is you have to determine your overhead expenses. And again, these are those things that are not easily controlled and are essentially unavoidable. Your personnel expense, your operating expense, preventive maintenance, repairs, new work, um, 
you know, is this the year that our parking lot asphalt has to be resurfaced? Um, what's that going to cost? Insurance, property and liability insurance premiums have been going up significantly, especially here in the West where wildfires are affecting um, property and casualty claims. Workers' comp premiums. Um, what are we going to do in terms of advertising or publicity or social media? Um, in some communities, churches have stopped advertising in the local newspaper um, or advertising on radio because those things just don't uh, result in any, any res returns to the church. There's no profitability in that. A primary advantage of an activities-based budget is the alignment of ministry goals and activities. This is one of the profitability factors. Um, will our summer block party bring 100 people or 500 people or 1,000 people to our campus? And if we bring those folks to our campus, how are we going to keep them coming back? You know, what's our follow-up going to be? Um, an activities-based budget doesn't consider the prior year or the current expenses as the starting point. You're going to budget each line item um, effectively according to the goals, the activities and goals. Um, ideally, an activities-based budget eliminates ineffective programs and eliminates wasteful expenses. You, you actually take a look and see what um, we've done and if there's a need to keep doing it in the future. The biggest disadvantages are these. It requires significant time and effort and your ministry leaders, your staff, they may not be interested or capable of researching ministry needs in order to project a budget. And frequently they have an inadequate understanding or don't know how to anticipate their ministry needs. Um, and that usually leads to improper allocation, either too much or too little. Um, this third bullet point, uh, you could kind of call that the setting goals, ministry goals. If, if I'm going to have these goals for 2024, what dollar amounts will it take to accomplish each one of those goals? Now, the zero-based annual budget is probably the most effective, but it's the one that's the most difficult to accomplish. And most churches don't go down this path at all. A zero-based budget, everything starts with a zero budget for the year. And if we're going to fund any particular line item on the expense side, it has to be analyzed. It has to be justified. You can't just say, well, we're going to plug in $300 for flowers. Why do we need to do that? What's the justification? And if you can't justify it, you don't add it in. So you ask these questions. Is it necessary? Why is it necessary? What's the value to the church? You ask the question, how will 2024 be different compared to 2023? And if an increase is being requested or recommended, why is that important? The value and vitality of a project expense determine its ranking and level of funding. If you're putting a high priority on mission work in your community or external to the community, somewhere else in the US or somewhere else in the world, uh, you need to rank that very high and it becomes a, a priority uh, expense. But this requires those ministry leaders to research and just submit their needs with the justification for the expense. It helps to avoid special interests. And uh, the question there, does a funding request really further the church's purposes? Um, all too often, when it comes time to creating a budget, churches gather together all the committee chairpersons and say, how much does your committee need? Um, and each one of those chairpersons comes 
to that meeting with a bias in favor of their committee. And they're, some of them are very adamant, very vocal, and they intimidate others. And um, it may not be that, that they need the kind of money that they're asking for, yet everybody gives in, they get the budget, and over the course of the next year, they don't spend what they've asked for. And it's money that could have been uh, allocated somewhere else in the budget to sustain work. A zero-based budget will be tightly constructed. There's minimal waste. There's very few excess allocations. The allocations are always justified by some sort of research or sound reasoning to justify the expense. And there's cost savings when you eliminate ineffective programs. Um, not just what you're not budgeting for that, but money that the church isn't spending on things that aren't doing anything. And profitability, now this profitability is, is mostly dollars and cents. It's not the primary focus. The primary focus is still on the kingdom work. What are we going to do to make this church uh, a valid member of the community to draw people in and keep them coming in? There are disadvantages. It's significantly more time consuming and research intensive. There can be costs associated with this if you have to do demo, if you have to purchase demographic reports or uh, salary comparisons, uh, you may have to pay a few hundred dollars for those things. Um, and so you, you have to budget for those expenses. One of the, the biggest disadvantages when I tried to implement this very early in my career as the church treasurer, uh, the staff and the ministry leaders just didn't have the skills or the knowledge, and primarily they didn't have the desire to do any of the research. And when I gave them a form and said, here, plug in the numbers, how much do you think you need in these areas? After three weeks, nobody had anything to plug in. They didn't do the work. And it was it was a, a waste of three weeks. Uh, justifying every light item, which is critical, is complex. And um, somebody's got to do it or a group of people have to do it. And it sometimes just doesn't get done. Regardless of which method of budgeting you're using on your expenses, Put these expenses last, your operating expenses, your office expenses, your personal expenses. Don't focus on those up front. Combine, these are your largest expense categories in your entire budget. Usually ends up being 50 to 60%. Ideally, it won't exceed 70% because the more beyond 70% that these expenses consume, that's less money that you have available to do the kingdom work that you thought was important. And structurally, these should all be at the end of the expense section of both your budget and your financial reports. You want people when they're looking at the budget to see the kingdom work stuff first. They know you have these expenses. They know you have to cover them. But what they're really interested in is what's the church doing as a church. Now, sometimes churches uh, struggle with their pastor's compensation, and a pastor's compensation is more than just wages, and sometimes churches don't budget properly for the pastor's compensation. The pastor does have taxable wages. The pastor should have non-taxable housing allowance. The pastor may be getting some form of church-provided benefits. It's not mandatory. And um, sometimes if you're trying to do benefits, but you don't have two or more employees, there's, it's not easy to provide benefits to the pastor that don't increase his taxation. And every pastor should have an accountable reimbursement plan available. Because the pastor 
if he spends money for a video as part of his sermon this week, it shouldn't come out of his pocket. The church should pay for that. But the pastor pays the expense. He turns in a receipt and the church reimburses him for that. Uh, you can create the accountable reimbursement plan. You can give the pastor the money in advance so that he has it available. Um, if he doesn't use it all, he needs to return the excess. But you can give him 60 days to use what was budgeted this month. So if he didn't use all of it in July, the leftover he can add to what he has available for August. After you've calculated all of your expenses, now you know exactly how much revenue you need to balance the budget. Unfortunately, churches sometimes just plug in revenue numbers. We had $150,000 of revenue last year. So we're going to plug in $160,000 this year. When you do that, you could end up with, at the bottom line, a shortfall. Oh, we have all these expenses, but we didn't put in enough revenue. So you either need to increase your revenue if that's realistic. If it's not realistic, then you have to reduce your expenses to get to the zero. If you end up with a surplus, gee, we, we're budgeting $160,000 of revenue, but we only came up with $120,000 worth of expenses. If that's true, increase your expense allocations or reduce your revenue expectations. What you can't have at the end of the map, revenue minus expenses must equal zero. If it's positive or negative and not zero, you've got to go back and make one of these adjustments. That's a balanced budget. Same amount of revenue, same amount of expenses. Knowing what your revenue streams are uh, is beneficial for both the church leaders and the congregation, your donors. Your regular revenue is the primary support for your overall budget. Your designated giving helps take some of the pressure off the general fund because it uses that money that folks are giving for children's ministry before it uses the general fund money for those same expenses. And if you're collecting money for that capital project, you have to know what that stream is. You've got to account for that money entirely separate. And then your miscellaneous revenue, as we talked about, is it's either unexpected or it's not easily classifiable in any other area. Unrestricted giving. Uh, sometimes it's called program giving. Sometimes it's called ties or envelopes. Uh, this is money that comes from known donors. And it really needs to be separately reported from the amount of money that comes in that's anonymous or loose plate giving. Those two types of giving combined is all of your regular revenue. You can use it for anything that the church needs to use it for. Designated giving, as I said, it reduces the general fund expense of the church for its kingdom work. Um, if you have $1,000 donated to children's ministry and children's ministry spends $500 on something, that designated fund balance is going to drop from 1000 to 500 but the general fund balance is going to remain the same because although you wrote the check for the expense from the general fund, the designated money replaces, it reimburses the general fund for that expense. Um, your church may be part of a large denomination and there may be structural offerings uh, throughout the year that your church participates in. Those offerings should be offsetting. In other words, um, you might plan for $1,000 for the summer mission offering of the denomination. 
And if people give twelve hundred, you write the check for twelve hundred, not the thousand dollars that you budgeted. But if you budget a thousand dollars and the people only give five hundred, you still only write the check for five hundred. The offering and the expense, those are offsetting amounts. These are all discretionary revenue streams. You don't use these specifically to balance the budget. You do use them to relieve the general fund or the regular revenue of some of the, the freight, so to speak, the carrying weight. Restricted revenue is derived from donations that are specifically solicited by the church for an approved special purpose. Capital giving campaigns are, are usually primary. Um, sometimes churches are approached by a donor who says, I want to give the church $100,000 to build a swimming pool. And if you don't have any plans to build a swimming pool, you should accept that money because that money can only be used for swimming pool unless you convince the donor to remove the restriction. Uh, so why would you want to accept money that you will never be able to use? Um, that's why the statement here, you should refuse unsolicited funds that the donor wants earmarked for an unexpected purpose. Um, it's just not wise to accept that money. You graciously uh, return the contribution and explain that it's not something that our church is focusing on. Restricted giving has to be accounted for apart from the general fund. That money cannot ever be used for general fund expenses. If you use restricted money for general fund expenses or payroll, somebody literally could end up going to jail because that's a criminal offense. You're, you're breaking the fiduciary trust of the donor. Um, ideally, all restricted money is held in a separate account. You have one checking account for the church's general spending, and you have a savings account or a money market account for the building fund. Don't hold all that money in one bank account because you will inadvertently spend money that you shouldn't have spent because you look at the balance, oh, we got lots of money there. You just don't want to do it. Miscellaneous revenue, as a, a component of your overall budget, this is probably going to be very small. Um, in, in my church budget of, of $650,000, uh, miscellaneous revenue was, was just a few thousand dollars as we earmarked it. Um, it's not anything that, that you rely on. Um, you know, if you have a, a cell phone tower with regular rent, you can plug that in, uh, as I did, under your, under your designated giving. We took all of our facility rental revenue and put it into a fund called facilities maintenance so that the money that people were paying to use our facility, we used to maintain the facility instead of the general fund. So even in that situation, it's no longer miscellaneous revenue. You have a specific purpose for it. So let's get to work on creating the annual budget. Uh, once you've established your chart of accounts, you can create a form or a spreadsheet that lists all of the revenue and expense items that you find in your accounting program. Then if you've got good financial reports, you take your six month um, report, January through June in this example, and begin plugging in all of your fixed expense estimates for the coming year. You want to fully fund your kingdom work expenses. Again, I, I just can't stress that enough. Um, you need to make sure that your pastor, your staff, your ministry leaders, your committee chairpersons understand that they do need to do some work and give you an idea of what they want for next year. They don't necessarily have to justify it if you're using the traditional budgeting method. Um, 
unless they're asking for double or triple increase for some reason. Uh, as part of your kingdom work, you may have denominational support or missionary or mission support. Uh, you might be supporting a missionary in Africa somewhere or Asia somewhere, and you want to make sure that you send a thousand dollars a month, let's say, to that ministry or mission. Um, but I encourage you to have your own local mission fund as part of your kingdom work. And you want to set aside fixed dollars or percentages of your monthly revenue, regular revenue, to support that work, all of this work. Once you've got your kingdom work funded, now you can make ex adjustments for the known or anticipated increases in your property tax, your insurance, utilities all of those recurring expenses that you've got six months worth of um, known figures to work with. Calculate any increases in personnel expenses. Now, your church may be in the habit of giving an annual pay raise. That's great. Um, at my church, we gave generally increases every other year, uh, keeping in mind what we were in a, a low inflationary period as well. Um, now, to avoid the deferred maintenance expense down the road, you want to begin planning for major repairs or facility expenses in your next year's budget because failure to fix those things now means a lot more money down the road. Um, so if you know it's coming, budget for it. It's going to increase the revenue required, but uh, it's better to take care of it than let it go uh, until you can't let it go any longer. Now it's time to do the math. After you've plugged in all of your expenses, you add them up. That's the total amount of revenue that you need for a balanced budget. So your next question is, is this total realistic? If it's realistic, then you can go back to the, the revenue side and say, you know, how much historically do we get uh, people giving to children's ministry or men's ministry or women's ministry or uh, vacation Bible school or the harvest festival? You can plug that designated giving in. Uh, you can plug in restricted giving, but restricted giving, you know, is not ideally there to balance the budget. Your ties and loose play, that's where most of your revenue uh, expectation is going to be. And if you, if you have a good handle on how much anonymous giving you get, for some churches, it, it runs about 8 to 10% of the annual giving. Uh, you can pretty much historically plug that kind of a number in. If your revenue says we need $150,000 for the year and um, your regular revenue is gonna be 110,000 or 120,000 out of the 150, you can figure eight to $12,000 perhaps as uh, the loose plate money and account for it that way. Now, in some churches, you might be using percentages to calculate your denominational or missionary set-asides. You might, um, in, in Southern Baptist churches, uh, there's the cooperative program, and the church might commit to giving 3 or 5 or 10%, perhaps, of their regular revenue to the cooperative program. Uh, so rather than that 10% detracting from money that you have for your kingdom work, you might want to consider grossing up the regular revenue to account for the 10% that you're going to contribute to the cooperative program. Uh, that way, the amount that your ministry leaders said they need for their kingdom work, 100% of that's going to be available. And you just need more other revenue to account for your missionary or denominational set-asides. 
when it comes time to present the annual budget, either to the church leadership or the members that are going to vote on approving the budget, it should be printed large and easy to read. There's no need to compare the current year's budget to the next year's proposed budget. What you can do somewhere, uh, maybe on the last page, as you'll see in my example, is indicate whether the total proposed budget is an increase or a decrease and what that change is in terms of dollars or percent. So this is how I presented uh, the last budget I did for my church for 2018. Um, took one page, eight and a half by 11, and printed all of the revenue streams on that page. And so you see that the three categories, regular revenue, and that represents what, 86%, almost 87% of all the revenue. Then the, the restricted revenue, it's listed here as restricted, it's really designated, um, represents about 14%. And miscellaneous revenue was not even 1%, very small amount of money. Look at that, $3,000 out of a $650,000 budget. Now, here's the way that I would present the expense side. And here you see that those expenses broken up into their kingdom work components. Uh, fellowship, and ministry on this page. And notice um, under like hospitality, under, under fellowship, there's four or five line items there, but there's not a, a, an account number or a fund number to go with that because all of the money is simply budgeted under hospitality. But those are typical of the kinds of expenses that this line item is paying for. When you move down to ministry and you look at children's and family ministry, uh, you see the kinds of things that that line item is going to be spent on. Rather than under deacon ministry, now you see three specific line items with targeted amounts, but specific line item numbers, because we wanted to be able to show in our financial reports exactly how much the deacons were using as their of their budget. Um, and then we could adjust the numbers from one year to the next based on what they were actually doing or what they projected to do. On the next page, the other two areas of kingdom work, missions and worship. And again, um, there are specific line items for all these or, um, missions expenses but limited numbers of line items under worship with uh, representative expenses that would add up in each of those four areas. Then we get to general operating expenses and general office expenses. And here you see line items uh, and fund numbers for all of these different things. Um, and then finally, the personnel expenses. And um, in this uh, budget, we start with uh, common expenses of personnel, payroll taxes, um, miscellaneous personnel expense. Um, you know, the staff would do a, a summer retreat to kind of reflect on how the first six months of the year had been going. Um, and then uh, for retirement, uh, we were matching a portion of staff contributions, up to $1,500 per staff member. Here you see the senior pastor has wages, has housing allowance, and has accountable reimbursements as part of his uh, total compensation package. And off to the right, just for assistance at what this amounts to, is how much is that per month? Uh, what is it per line item for a, a 26 pay period payroll? And then what's that amount 
every two weeks the biweekly total and what's the annual total times 12. Once this is all assembled, now you have the calculations. The, you see the total expenses in the green box match, uh, and the total revenue in the green box matches the total expenses in the pink box. Um, and you see how the regular revenue, the designated giving, <clears throat> and the miscellaneous giving is divided up to make up that total. And then we calculated in the gross up for uh, the missions giving and our own local missions fund. And a, a little note there to show exactly how that's calculated. What really helps the church to understand how the budget is assembled is to break it up into a pie chart like this so that they can see again in the legend, the four areas of kingdom work right at the top, fellowship, ministry, missions, worship, adds up to a little more than 30% of the budget. And then the operating expenses, the office expenses and the personnel expense makes up the balance and the total is 100% of the budget. This really, handing this page to the church after they've seen all of the numbers makes it easier for them to digest because they can see it broken out into these categories. So to, to summarize, you can't begin to budget until you've established a proper chart of accounts. It has to be logically established. It needs to follow a sequence similar to the one that I showed earlier, the 1,000s, the 2,000s, the 3,000s, the 4,000s are the revenue, and the 5,000s are where you write most of your checks, and then 6,000s are your paychecks. Um, you have to know where it is you want to go in 2024. I mean, you wouldn't say at the beginning of 2024 in your own household, um, we're going to put $10,000 aside for a family vacation. Where are we going to go? Well, I don't know, but we'll have $10,000 to get there. And then middle of the year, it's time to plan the vacation. You take a, a survey of your household, where do you want to go? And everybody agrees, we want to go to Hawaii. And now you discover that to take five people to Hawaii for a week, it's going to be $15,000, but we only budgeted 10. You, you just can't, you can't work a plan like that. You have to know where you're going before you leave. Um, you need to create an organized spreadsheet or budget allocation form so that you can put all those numbers onto paper, add them up conveniently. You've got to get your budget requests from the ministries, from the various committees in your church. You have to plug in your fixed expenses based on what your actuals have been and what you can foresee in the future. You need to set goals for any denominational or external support or local mission work and outreach events that you want to do in your own church. You can plug in reasonable designated giving targets. Uh, if you go over, that's great. You have money that um, takes pressure off the general fund in the future. Um, but then you have to calculate the additional amount of regular revenue that you need to balance the budget and then prepare that final budget for presentation. I want to talk, as we complete this webinar, I want to talk very quickly about what's called true fund accounting. Uh, true fund accounting is actually the preferred method of accounting for churches and nonprofit organizations. It's very different than what most businesses use when it comes to accounting. True fund accounting software seamlessly tracks revenue uh, for a designated purpose and prevents the misuse of those donations for other things. It seamlessly, it automatically reimburses the general fund with the available designated 
or restricted funds as you spend that money. So I found the, this list of 10 reasons to use a true fund accounting software program. Number one, keeps designated and restricted funds separate from the general fund, at least on paper. They can all be in uh, the same bank account, but and, and ideally your restricted funds aren't. But if they are all together in one account, you have a way to keep them straight and know that you're not spending money you shouldn't be. You can measure the effectiveness of programs with a true fund accounting program. You can prepare a variety of staff and congregational reports. If the children's minister wants to know how much money they have left in their budget, what they've spent, you can isolate that report with a click of a mouse button. If your church is receiving grant money, as some churches do, um, you may have to spend money before the grant reimburses you. So you can use a true fund accounting program to do what's called encumbering grant funds prior to their expenditures. You can seamlessly perform allocation of designated or restricted giving to expenses. You can prepare the reports that grant donors need to see. They don't necessarily want to see your entire accounting uh, financial report. They often just want to see how you have used their grant money for the expenses you said you're going to use them. Uh, if your church is blessed to have $2 million of revenue or more in a year, you're required to have audited financial reports. And true fund accounting software will be compliant with nonprofit accounting standards. One of the best reasons for true fund accounting software is that one program can manage separate budgets. You have a budget for the church. If you have also have a church operated school, you don't want to commingle the school expenses with church expenses necessarily. So you have a separate budget for the school. You have a separate budget for the daycare, but you can do all of that with one accounting program. You don't have to have three different programs. It shows the church in your financial reports how the budgeted money is being tracked and increases donor confidence and it results in increased giving. I know this to be true because when I came in as treasurer in 2008 at my church, our annual budget was about $325,000. And at the end of my last year as treasurer or in the middle of my last year as treasurer in 2018, our proposed budget, uh, our actual budget for 2018 was 650 some thousand, 654,000. And the budget for 2019 was going to be somewhere around 660,000. Um, giving went up because we were using good software correctly. And also integrates with other software programs. You might have a separate donor management program. Um, an online giving program, uh, you might have a separate payroll program. If your fund accounting software provider doesn't have those uh, available as a complete package, at least the software will integrate with all these other programs. Many of you are using QuickBooks, and I understand why it's cheap, it's okay but it's not true fund accounting. If you're trying to keep track of restricted giving or designated giving, you have to plug those numbers in manually. And anytime you're required to do something manually, you increase the opportunity for errors and mistakes are made. And um, honestly, the, the year after I left as treasurer, the new treasurer switched to QuickBooks from the accounting program that I had used for 10 years. The first six months of his financial reports were a mess because they had plugged in all the year-end numbers for the, the designated funds, and those balances didn't change at all from one month to the next. And I knew that couldn't possibly be true. 
And it's because he didn't realize he had to do the manual transfers back and forth. So it, it, it's not the best program for churches to use. I've had a, a relationship with Aplo Software. They're headquartered in Fresno. Uh, they have an extensive true fund accounting software package that includes uh, your contact management and your donor management. Um, it integrates with several different payroll programs. And it's just, it was designed specifically for churches and nonprofits. It wasn't something that was taken off the shelf and customized in some other way. It was built from the ground up. So I've, I've been recommending Aplos. I don't get any money from Aplos to do that. Um, and you can actually get six months of, of trial use of Aplos to see if you like the way it works. But I strongly recommend that you, you take a look at Aplos if you're looking for accounting software. So we made it pretty much on time. Uh, this is my contact information. Um, please know that you can call me. You can send text messages to that phone number. Um, I almost always respond to phone calls uh, at the time that they come in, unless I'm in a meeting like this one. Um, I respond to text messages usually within minutes or hours. And same thing with email. If I don't respond to it the same day, I'll respond to it within 24 hours. Um, so know that you can call me 24 seven. I, I answer the phone at three o'clock in the morning because a lot of times I'm up at three o'clock in the morning anyway, doing work. Um, so Roy, I think I see that we have some activity in the chat. Are there questions that uh, yes. Yes, happen uh, along the way? So you answered, uh, you were clairvoyant. You answered Wendy's question about software before, she, uh, <laughs> without noting that she asked it. And, uh, um, and then I have another question from Wendy, but I wanted to tell you, I figured out the Hawaii dilemma you presented. The trip was going to cost 15,000 and you only budgeted 10,000 is you just don't come back. That, that <laughs> solves that, right? Okay. I'm well, gonna... I, my, my, I, my wife and I went there last year to celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary. And what we didn't budget for was a COVID booster shot because oh. uh, they had this, they still have this crazy restriction. If you don't have your first and second shots, you can't come in unless you stay in quarantine for seven days. Well, what is that going to do to a seven day vacation? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and then I just put in the chat for everyone to see another question from Wendy regarding repairs and maintenance. S maintenance re expenses should we classify as expenditures in one year or can we allocate to the useful life such as five years if it estimates the benefit for the next five years if you're planning for obsolescence then that's what is um that's what's referred to as amortizing the future expense so if you know that five years down the road, we're going to spend $20,000 for a new air conditioning unit. You can begin to set that $20,000 aside in a designated account to have that money available. It does mean that you need to budget it. At the, the Walnut Church, we had built up because we were renting the church worship center to another church, and we had other rental revenue coming in. We, over the course of a, a couple of years, once I implemented it, we had a, a physical plant maintenance fund that had forty or fifty thousand dollars in it. So if an expense came up, we generally had the money on hand to pay for it without having to to allocate. But you know, in the years that the parking lot needed to be repaved and uh, or slurry sealed and and repainted, we knew that was going to be a twenty thousand dollar expense. We plugged in that twenty thousand dollar expense. If you have if you have something that you're going to expend the money this year and you're thinking about dividing it up over the next five years, I, I wouldn't do that. I don't think that's wise. I do not see any other questions in the chat, um, but I do want to let you know it's not too late to leave one. But if it's OK, could, could I ask you a question? Max? Sure. OK. And I'm sure this is one that is relevant to people who um, are watching either now or later when it comes to the budget and it being a public document are 
or should, do you have an, I'm sure this is an opinion question. Should staff members' salaries be public information? And each church has its own uh, protocols for that. Um, I personally, I don't see uh, a challenge with that. Um, churches are still, for the most part, insulated from most state laws. And even in California, where we have some certain uh, pay transparency provisions in law now, I think the churches are pretty much exempt from those. But honestly, if if the pastor is getting a certain amount of money, the, the church needs to know what the pastor is getting, not just lump all the the payroll expense into one number and not know that the pastor is getting 90% of that and the church secretary is getting almost nothing. Again, it, it goes to donor confidence. If if people feel good about how the church is spending its money, they shouldn't be concerned that the pastor is getting sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year. Um, on the other hand, if if they see that the pastor is only getting twenty five thousand, and they know that, um, my goodness, I, how can the pastor support a family of four on twenty five thousand? Um, that helps folks to ask the question: Why isn't the pastor getting paid more money? So I I'm in the camp that says you should just disclose everything, put it out okay. there. Excellent. Very, now, now very helpful. You, you made the statement that the budget is a public document. It's only public within the membership. Of sure. The church. Sure. It, you don't normally share your, your budget with the outside world. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Public meaning with the congregation or people right. who are uh, at the meeting. I just one closing question, just based on your experience in having public budget meetings, any tips on the best ways to have a, a smooth and successful budget meeting you know it seems like there's always this disgruntled person that gets up with half-baked information and can cause consternation How, what are some maybe some best practices to have an effective well first off robert's rules of order says that when you're conducting a business meeting and you have a a motion before the assembly that no person is allowed to speak more than twice on the motion so you want to absolutely enforce that rule that John, who keeps getting up every 30 seconds with some other issue, he's had his two chances and now he's got to be quiet till everybody else has had their chance. In my experience, giving the, the financial reports to the church every quarter, when we got to the annual meeting and it was time to present the budget for next year, it was already in a format that they had seen and were familiar with. And as the treasurer, I presented the budget and I tried to anticipate those questions in advance and made that part of my presentation. In some cases, the questions that we got were, how come we're not spending more money on this or that? Um, in one budget, we were going to uh, at, we allocated $35,000 for a new LED sign for the church. And the only question that came up was, how come the sign isn't bigger? <laughs> you know, those are good questions to get. Sure. Sure. We, we never had any divisive uh, budget meetings. It was pretty much, and it wasn't a rubber stamp. Um, I mean, people felt good about the budget. And the questions that we got one year was, um, we haven't had a, a children or youth minister for the last 18 months. Is there any plan for that? And I could point to the budget and say, yes, see this local missions allocation that we've started. I think the staff is planning to add a, a children's minister, or youth minister in this next year. We don't know for sure that that's going to happen, but if it does happen, we don't have it budgeted, but we've got the money set aside for it. And they felt good about that. And that's exactly what did happen the next year. In fact, we added two staff persons in the middle of the year. Excellent. Is part of what you do, Max, as uh, president of church and ministry compliance consulting, do you consult on, on budgets? Absolutely. Absolutely. Church can send me their financial reports and I can 
figure out and their chart of accounts and I can figure out where they may need some help uh, if they need to create a, a different physical platform for their budget, I can do that for them in Excel, or I can lead them through uh, into an accounting program like Aplos. And and uh, what I want your your folks to understand mm -hmm. is um, my organization is my ministry, and I don't charge anything for what I do. Um, if I spend money on behalf of a church to file a federal form or something, um, I send the church an invoice to be reimbursed for that. Um, and after all is said and done, if a church finds value in the services that I provided and they want to make a contribution, to my organization, which is a religious nonprofit corporation, I gladly accept whatever they send. And, um, I don't take any salary or, uh, personal expense from the ministry. All the, the ministry money is used to operate the ministry itself, provide resources to churches. Excellent. want to thank everybody for their time. And uh, Excellent. Well, thank you, Max. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. 